Welcome again, and welcome to today's guest, Sonia Sidarova, CEO and founder of NAVE, Ananda. And she's joining us today from Belgium, um, in an undisclosed location in Belgium. Um, and she will talk with about, um, she will tell us what her company and her product and what she personally um, does in the area of Kanban metrics. So how do you measure a Kanban flow to provide faster, smoother, and more efficient value delivery to your customer? And with that, Sonia, over to you and to your presentation. Welcome again. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Um, I'm sharing my screen now. Okay, so today indeed, I would like to talk about achieving fast, smooth and predictable delivery of customer value with Kanban Analytics. But before I jump into the details on how we get there, I would like to spend some time explaining some of the fundamentals of the Kanban methods. The Kanban method suggests an approach of managing the flow of work instead of workers. It's a system that works upon the speed and efficiency of your process by minimizing waste and team overburden. It switches the focus from individual to collective performance. Let's go through the main Kanban practices suggested by the method. There are six core Kanban practices. Visualize workflow, limit work in progress, manage flow, make policies explicit, implement feedback loops, and improve collaboratively. The first practice is visualize the flow of work or mapping your value stream on a Kanban board. Each state corresponds to a status. Each ticket represents a piece of work. Work flows through the process as tickets move across the board. You can implement that practice using the Kanban boards in Jira or Trello. This gives you complete visibility on how much work you have on your plate and significantly improves the collaboration within the team. Apply work in progress limits. Using the Kanban board alone isn't enough to support a smooth and efficient workflow. Your processes can still get stuck if there is too much work in progress. Too much whip leads to delays, and your team will be forced to constantly, constantly switch the context, trying to handle all work at once. Constant context switching is not effective, and it comes with its cost. In fact, it's estimated to cause at least a 10% penalty per switch. Multitasking makes your team members feel busier while delivering less. Too much whip leads to overburden, poor service quality and negative effect on your team's engagement. You need to control the amount of work that goes in and out of your system to prevent that effect. Implementing WIP limits helps your team complete work faster by staying focused. The point is to get more things done rather than doing more things. Jira provides the option to set WIP limits on each status on your Kanban board, which is a good starting point. If you use Trello, there is a power-up developed by them. It's called List Limits Power-up. You can use it to set WIP limits for each work in progress list in your board. Manage your workflow. An efficient workflow requires consistent management of the work that goes through your process to keep tasks entering the stream in a smooth manner. Balancing demand with capacity is the key here. Managing flow also means removing obstacles and eliminating bottlenecks. The practice of applying whip limits will introduce some idle time to your team members. If your team is not able to start new work as the whip limit has been reached, they will have to collaborate with each other and swarm outstanding tasks to complete them faster. The focus is moved to the impediments in the system and their prompt resolution. Make policies explicit. Every policy should be made explicit from when certain tasks enter the workflow, how are they treated, to when they are considered completed. It is crucial that everyone on the team understands how to handle the different types of work items. 
you can use classes of service to group tasks according to their priority by using labels or custom fields. Different policies apply to different levels of priority. The policies in place for an emergency will be quite different to those for routine maintenance, for example. There are four default classes of service in Kanban, expedite, fixed delivery date, standard, and intangible. Expedites are tasks that must be taken care of immediately. They suspend the rest of the work in progress and should be completed as soon as possible. They are allowed to break the whip limits. Normally, only one task in this class can be in progress at any one time. Fixed delivery date is work that must be delivered before certain dates. This could include important project milestones, compliance tasks, or release dates. An example class of service policy would be that fixed delivery date can make up no more than 10% of the work in progress. Standard class of service would represent features and improvements. The bulk of your work items should be in this class and a policy would be that they should be processed by the first, the first come first serve algorithm. Intangible class is used to collect necessary but not urgent maintenance tasks that often get pushed aside for higher priorities. Keep in mind that an in intangible ticket can become an expedite if it is neglected for a long enough time. Implement feedback loops. For the big picture overview, Kanban meetings are used to set your direction on a daily, weekly, and long-term basis. Each meeting, incorporates feedback from other meetings to make informative decisions. The Kanban method suggests seven cadences you can use to foster communication between all parties. The purpose of these cadences can be divided into three groups, getting things done, doing the right things, and doing things better, each of them feeding the others with new information. Improve, improve collaboratively. Kanban practices focus on improvement via incremental evolutionary changes. The method provides all the means to monitor continuous improvement efforts. As the system improves, delivery times decrease, and your workflow becomes faster and more predictable. The Kanban method helps you achieve faster, better, and more predictable service delivery by optimizing your workflow efficiency. The absolute minimum to successful Kanban implementation is establishing a Kanban pool system. Visualize your workflow and limit your whip. Instead of pushing tasks into the process, let teams pull work only when there is a demand for it and they have the capacity to handle that demand. There are three basic flow metrics that can help you measure the performance of your workflows. Cycle time which measures the time between starting and finishing work on a given task, throughput, which is the number of tasks delivered on a certain day, week, or month, and whip or work in progress, or the amount of tasks available in each process state. The goal is to limit work in progress, reduce cycle times, and increase throughput. NAFE is the tool to help you track and analyze the main flow metrics. It's a Kanban analytics suite that helps teams optimize their workflow performance in order to achieve fast, smooth, and predictable delivery of customer value. We help managers establish a stable system to be able to develop more predictability in their delivery processes. We enable our customers to identify the imp impediments in their workflow, as well as make accurate delivery forecasts. We provide integrations with the most popular management tools on the market, Jira, Trello, as well as Asana and Azure DevOps. NAFE is available as an add-on in the Atlassian Marketplace and the Trello Power Apps directory. We also provide a manual data upload version for those customers who use Jira server and their instances are not publicly available. That option, in fact, is quite suitable in case you support strict security policies and you need to anonymize your data. You can use our API to upload your file, files and automate the process. 
Behind the scene, we fetch all the data from your Kanban board. We analyze the activities of your cards and we build the charts to help you manage your workflow effectively. We pull all of your data from the moment of your board creation. There is no limit on the historical records you may want to analyze. And we synchronize any changes immediately. So you can track your progress in real time and basically any updates in your Kanban board are instantly reflected in your graphs. Let me quickly show you how it works. So how do you know how much is in progress and how much is actually being done? The cumulative flow diagram provides an overview of the current state of your process by tracking the total number of tasks in progress each day. The graph is built from colored bands with each band indicating how many tasks are present in each process state. You can also see the accumulated number of tasks completed, those in the done state, in the selected time frame. The horizontal distance between the top and the bottom line of a CFD area at any point along the graph is your approximate average cycle time. Approximate average cycle time shows how long it took on average for items to complete on the selected day. The cumulative flow diagram also enables you to spot bottlenecks instantly. If one or more of the areas that represent work in progress start expanding, then it signifies a bottleneck stemming from your workflow. The top line of the graph represents the arrival rate of tasks while the bottom line shows their departures. We need to monitor how the lines move over time in order to maintain a stable system. If WIP is increasing, then the distance between the lines will expand. This means that the arrival rate is higher than the departure rate and denotes that there is a bottleneck in the system and your team is struggling to deliver results. To maintain a stable process, strive to keep your WIP as consistent as possible. If the WIP is consistent, arrival rate and departure rate lines will both grow in sync and the distance between them will stay equal. Um, it is important to say, though, that the data displayed on a CFD depicts only what has happened for a given process and it shouldn't be used for any type of future predictions. When it comes to future predictions, there are two approaches trying to provide the answer to when will this be done question, an estimate and a forecast. What's the difference? Estimates are predictions based on guesswork, judgment, or intuition. The prediction is delivered as a single value. It could be a date or a number of days, for example. An estimate doesn't involve any probability of its occurrence. Forecasts, on the other hand, are based on historical performance data. The prediction is communicated as a range of values and the probability of those values occurring. Forecasting is faster, cheaper and much more reliable than estimating. In Kanban and in flow-based systems in general, teams commit to the individual task by making just-in-time commitments. Just-in-time commitment is a commitment that happens at the last possible moment. This is the moment when we start working on something. This approach provides us with a lot of flexibility as we're able to reprioritize up until the moment a task gets put in the workflow. Once the work is in the process, it is considered committed and the team should do everything in their power to meet that commitment. Commitments should be communicated as forecasts. They should come with a range of cycle times and the probability of achieving each of them. For example, we expect this task to be delivered in less than 10 days and we are 85% certain it will be. And there is a 95% chance to deliver this task within 13 days. The cycle time scatter plot can be of great help when it comes to making probabilistic forecasts. The diagram <clears throat> displays all of your completed tasks as dots scattered on a plot. It tells you how long tasks have taken to complete. By observing and analyzing your cycle times and lead times, you will be able to evaluate how fast you're delivering value to your customers. The goal is to reduce the delivery times to an optimal level for your team. The dotted horizontal lines stretching across the graph are called percentile lines. 
we use percentiles to establish service level agreements and define the probability of different commitment points being met. For example, the 50th percentile on this scatter plot points to eight days. This means that half of the tasks so far have been completed in less than eight days. We can now say that any future task we take on has a 50% chance of being finished in less than eight days. Of course, the percentile you use to define SOAs largely depends on your context. You and your customers may be happy with an 85% certainty, or you both may need a confidence level that's higher than that. You can also filter your data by class of service. It is highly likely that the 85th percentile for fixed delivery date tasks comes with a different cycle time, time than the 85th percentile for expedites, for example. That way, you can provide different SOAs for different work items you are committing. The best chance for delivering on time comes when you make sure you start on time. When you start working on your assignments too early, you're both wasting capacity on work that is not yet due and running out of capacity for work that is due. When you start too late though, you risk delaying your work and breaking your commitments. The longer you wait, the higher the chance of a delay. So in order to identify the best time to start, look at your probability forecast for the specific class of service you're interested in. The ideal time range to start your work is any time between the 99th percentile and the 85th percentile. So let's say you need to deliver on 30th of May and your forecast says there is a 99th percent chance to finish a standard task within 23 days and an 85th percent chance to finish it within 11 days. This means that the ideal time to start your work is between 23 and 11 days before the delivery date or any time in the range of 7th of May till 19th of May. By initiating your work within the normal start date range, you will have at least an 85% chance of delivering it on time. With that being said, I'd like to get back to CFD and explain why it shouldn't be used for any type of future prediction. To be able to make any projections, the cumulative flow diagram should display a backlog, and this is not typical for CFD. Even if that's the case, it might be tempting to perform a straight line projection of, of the throughput line until it crosses the backlog line in order to predict the end date of finishing all the work available in your backlog. There are a few reasons why this approach doesn't work. First, this prediction is based on averages and predictions based on averages are not reliable. Making predictions based on an average can land you in some hot water. Forecasts based on averages would make sense only if you know something about the shape of the underlying distribution of your data. If you don't, there is no way to associate any percentile with average value. There can be exactly 50% or much more than 50% or significantly less than 50% chance of that goal being achieved. If we don't know the distribution, then we cannot give a probability of where the average falls. And if we don't know a probability, then we cannot make a forecast. Furthermore, as the time goes by, there will be variability in both the backlog and average throughput, and thus the intersection point will probably change. Then, straight line projections don't provide a date range. And even if you draw pessimistic and optimistic lines for both the backlog and the throughput to produce a date range, you still will make that assumption based on a good feeling and not based on historical performance data. And besides, this approach doesn't provide the probabilities of hitting this date range. If you really want to get probabilistic forecasts, then you should use tools like the cycle time scatter plot or Monte Carlo simulation, which we'll discuss in a moment. <clears throat> to optimize your workflow performance, you need to break your delivery times down to smaller pieces and evaluate the improvement opportunities. This is best achieved in the cycle time breakdown chart. The diagram displays the cycle times of your completed tasks split by status. By analyzing the different sections on the bars, you can assess how the time spent in each status affects the overall time needed to finish your work. 
the most important information to get from the cycle time breakdown chart is how the data changes in time. It is an indicator of continuous improvement. If the longest sections are going down, this is a sign that your improvement efforts are paying off. But if the cycle times are going up, it is better to take a step back and analyze the reasons behind that behavior. The cycle time histogram shows the frequency distribution of the completion times of the tasks in your workflow. By analyzing the distribution of your cycle times, you will be able to determine whether there is too much variability in your process. A widespread indicates your cycle times very significantly and your workflow is inconsistent. Average cycle time is a measure of performance. In this chart, we show the mean, median, and mode average cycle times and how the trends build over time. Ideally, the lines should be close to each other, stay even, or go down. If the values are going up, then you might need to reevaluate your work in progress limits or alter your process policies in order to establish a faster delivery workflow. The aging chart enables you to track your current work in progress. It uses the same visual format as your Kanban board, with each column representing a status in your workflow. The aging chart shows how many days a task has already spent in progress. The colored zones draw the timeline of how your tasks have advanced in the past. For example, the green zones show the times that 50% of your previous tickets have spent in each status. By observing how your current work is moving through the zones, you have a pretty good chance of meeting your commitments. The higher the dots, the larger the chance of delay. We recommend taking a closer look at the tasks that move to the yellow zone. These tasks have already spent more time in your process than half of the tickets completed so far. As long as the tickets your tickets don't cross the person tasks you use to define your SOAs, you will be delivering on time. If you've committed to the 85th percentile, for example, and your work item just moved to the orange zone, crossing the 70th percentile, don't cut from the scope or don't rush the implementation to be able to deliver it on time. That will sacrifice the quality of your work. Instead, in order to make sure you keep your commitment, expedite your task. By expediting a task, you are effectively suspending all of the remaining work that's currently in progress. Essentially, you borrow time that would otherwise be reserved for another task in order to fulfill your commitment. However, keep in mind that expediting work generates flow depth, so make sure that the short-term benefits are worth it in the long run. The aging chart also allows you to change your basis date to see how your process looked like on a certain date in the past. It is very useful during retrospectives to see how your tickets were aging back then. I have been talking about stable systems for a while now. According to Little's law, maintaining a stable system depends on two main factors, your work in progress and your average age of work in progress. For these two metrics, the key is consistency. Stable systems are determined by keeping both your WIP and the average age of your WIP consistent. And the more stable your delivery workflow is, the more predictable it becomes. The average age of WIP and cycle time are essentially the same metric, only cycle time is measured against completed tasks, whereas the age of a task is a measure concerning tasks that are still in progress. If the average age of your WIP stays roughly equal on a daily basis, then its trend line will be linear, neither increasing nor decreasing over time. This means that you're maintaining a stable system. If you find that the line is sporadic, at times increasing or decreasing dramatically, this points to an inconsistent average age and at the root cause of these spikes bottlenecks in the system that need to be addressed. The throughput run chart displays the throughput of your team on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis and compares its values over time. Each bar consists of colored section representing the type of completed work. The throughput breakdown chart on the top helps you evaluate what kind of requests are demanding most of the time. 
It is especially effective when you want to emphasize the high volume of expedite requests you're handling. The throughput line chart visualizes how trends have developed. Ideally, the line should stay even or increase smoothly. The closer the values are, the smoother your process. The throughput histogram allows you to visualize how consistently your team is delivering results. It is calculating your throughput averages using the mean, median, and mode values of your throughput frequency distribution. And your average throughput over the month is the most important metric you want to discover from this chart. It is a representation of your capacity to deliver results. Over time, you can identify trends in your delivery rates. Ideally, your average throughput should increase smoothly or stay at similar levels. Flow efficiency is another key metric in Kanban, telling you how much time you spend actually working on your assignments. Essentially, flow efficiency is the ratio between your active time and total time. While trying to improve their flow efficiency, many teams simply start working on more commitments, hoping it will bolster their production rate. This, however, is a misconception, as more work in progress means more multitasking and queuing. Along with an imbalance between demand and throughput, this is in fact one of the most common causes behind long delivery times. Any reduction of inactive time will improve your overall cycle time. Looking at wait time is usually the easiest and cheapest area to investigate first when it comes to process improvement. Improving flow efficiency starts with visualizing your wait. To be able to measure your flow efficiency, you have to design your Kanban board to support that concept. Make sure you divide the statuses in your workflow into working statuses where tasks are being worked on and queue statuses where tasks are held up waiting. This is the foundation of a Kanban pool system. Instead of pushing tasks into the process, teams pull work from the queue states once they finish what they've started. Using this approach, you will be able to measure the time spent in your queue states. You can use the flow efficiency chart to track the flow efficiency of your work items, as well as your average flow efficiency. Once you have identified the tasks with the longest waiting times, think about the reasons behind their delays. The higher your flow efficiency is, the faster and smoother tasks flow through your process. You can also assess how your efficiency trends changed over time, to evaluate your improvement efforts. Your due date performance is a measure of reliability. Furthermore, it's a factor determining the quality of your initial forecast. You can evaluate your due date performance by comparing the time between the start date and the due date of a task with the actual time it took to deliver your work. The due date performance chart can be of great help here. For each work item, it visualizes the predicted time versus the actual time and plots a regression line of your performance. The predicted time is calculated as the difference between your commitment point, the moment when the work entered your workflow, and the due date of the ticket, while your completion time is the difference between the same starting point and the ticket's actual done date. The line plotted through the chart is called a regression line. It runs roughly through the middle of all the data points. The slope of the line is the correlation between your predicted time and the actual time you spent finishing your work. It helps you assess the accuracy of your predictions and evaluate how efficiently your system is running. The most important part of analyzing your due date performance is assessing whether your work has been delivered on time. The on-time delivery widget will display the percentage of times that you managed to deliver before your due date approached and how such trends have developed. For example, if you release 10 features today and four of them were overdue, your due date performance for that day would be 60%. By using probabilistic forecasting to set your commitments, starting your assignments on time and actively managing your work in progress, you will be able to produce more accurate future predictions and keep your commitments, which will ultimately result in, in, in higher customer satisfaction. To come up with a range of probabilities 
when forecasting completion dates for multiple tasks, we use Monte Carlo delivery date simulation. The simulation relies on a large number of random trials based on past throughput data to predict the throughput for a future time frame. You define the start date and the number of tasks, and the simulation will provide a range of delivery dates and the probability coming with each date. For any day in the future, it will use the throughput of a random day in the past to simulate how many items are likely to get done. The simulation is repeated tens of thousands of times before the results are presented in the form of a probability distribution with percentiles increasing from left to right. The further you go in time, the greater the certainty of completing all tasks. Monte Carlo number of task simulation works on the same principle, but instead of predicting the due date of a certain amount of tasks, it produces the probability forecast on how many items can be completed within a certain time frame. If you're interested in having a demo session with your own data at NAVE, please contact me and I'll be happy to schedule a call. We're giving away a special discount today. You can save 10% on your annual plan if you subscribe until 13th of June. I'll send you the discount code in a moment. I hope you got some valuable takeaways out of this presentation and it will help you achieve faster, smoother and more predictable delivery value uh, of value. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. It was very educational. I learned a lot. I always have trouble remembering all those metrics and uh, that was very helpful. Um, so uh, while I promote everybody to panelists so that you can have a discussion with our guests, uh, we have two questions from Frank. And the first one would be, or three questions. Uh, how does NAVE handle separate backlog boards while the work board is not including a subset of status? Let me promote Frank first because I do not understand that question. So, um, to, yeah, please. maybe indeed Frank can uh, can join us and uh, elaborate a little bit more about this. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, um, so uh, we have basically a separate board to host our... Uh, Frank? So, yeah, hi. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have basically a separate board to host our backlog since there are, uh, we have like different input channels for tickets. So we have like customers and internal uh, customers and our teams itself, of course. Uh, so um, how does uh, Nave handle that not all statuses are on the same board? Because like we do our work in a separate board and we can use our, let's say, uh, backlog board in order to uh, choose uh, the tickets which we promote for working on. Um when you create a new dashboard at NAVE, it should be associated with one board in JIRA. Um, this means that if you have multiple boards in JIRA, uh, you will have to create separate dashboards and track the metrics separately. However, there are clients of ours that uh, have similar use case like you do, and what they do is to create a, a board in JIRA and apply certain filters and sub queries in order to fetch the data from all the, the backlog boards that you're interested in. By using this approach, you will be able to collect all of the tickets that run through the different boards available in one place. And then you will be able to project that information into a dashboard in NAVE and further track the flow metrics of the whole life cycle of your tickets. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And you, had, you had two additional questions, Frank. So yes. Why don't you just uh, continue? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm uh, just uh, asking questions. Um, so how does NAVE handle uh, fluctuations in the um, uh, team? For example, like vacation, uh, sickness, new hires, layoffs, uh, is there any indicator on how many people are in the board? Do you have that as a, as a measurement as well in, in NAVE? So we don't count users since we don't charge per user. 
you can involve absolutely everyone who is working on your workflows and everyone will be available in your dashboards. Um, you can use, we provide a lot of flexibility through the controls and the filter sections in NAIF. You can filter your data, group your data um, by team member, by issue type. You can exclude certain issue types. Uh, you can exclude certain members if you want. We also, um, we also fetch all of your custom fields. So if you have any specific implementation that's based on a certain custom field, you can use the filter by custom field to make more granular analysis for a certain type of item. We also have the option to exclude weekends and soon we'll have the option to exclude non-working time as well. So you can try, you can compare the, the total time spent, uh, the lead times, like how much time your client is waiting for the work, as well as how much time you actually spent working by filtering out all of the non-working time. Ah, okay, cool. Do you have, um, uh, for example, like not, not every task has the same size. So of course there's like uh, bite size, which can be done like quite quickly. And there are like uh, tasks which take like normal amount of time and some tasks which take like longer amounts of time and maybe involve even more people from the team. Uh, do you also, uh, or can you uh, use that data or do you use a custom field to show that off that you have like a, a unit for estimation or does, is it, does it just take the task leap time? If you're really interested to perform more granular analysis on the uh, sizes of the work uh, that you've estimated, um, then indeed you can use a custom field and then you can filter by this date. However, in flow-based systems, we don't care about the size of the items. We work with the variability of your past performance data. There is a huge chance that the work that you're taking home is very similar to the work that you've already done in the past. That's why we work with probabilities. We take into consideration the frequency distribution, all the whole range of the cycle times, meaning we will take into consideration tasks that have taken one day, two days, five days, 20 days, 150 days. We will take the whole range and then we are going to simulate what's the probability of having a certain task that is similar to in, in a class of service or as a type of task, what's the probability of finishing that task for a certain time in the future. So we're going to sort that data set based on the times of your, uh, that your tasks have taken to complete. And we will say in 85% of the chances, you will complete this task in less than five days. Less is the key here. We don't say that every task of this type will take five days. No, what we're saying is that the time that we will need to start the work, to handle the rest of the work in progress, to take care of the bottlenecks, blockers, defects, any impediments and any delays that have been caused. And we will have 85% chance to finish that work in less than five days. It could be one day, it could be five, it could be three days, but we have an 85% confidence that we will be done in five days. Of course, you can use 30% certainty if your clients are not happy with your, uh, with your forecast or 50% certainty or 75% certainty, but the size of the task doesn't matter. So if you have the data, if you, if you have collected the data and you analyze your frequency distribution of the cycle times back in time, you will be able to come up with a commitment that will be based on that past past performance. Um, Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I'm going to share the discount code in the chat with you guys. 
And um, there is another question in the chat while you do that. Um, there you go. The question not related to the tool, but more on the approach. How to handle the challenge of a changing mindset of people regarding continuous improvement by constantly looking to data to improve development processes? It's a great question. Thank you. Um, when you change something, when you perform a change in something, you are basically saying whatever you have done so far, it's not valuable anymore. We don't respect it anymore. It's not needed in our organization anymore. You have to change. For example, if, if you've been uh, promoted from a developer to a team lead, or if, you've been, if your position changed from, for example, product manager to scrum master, you have been introduced to a new environment with new responsibilities and you change the way things used to be. As such, that process meets resistance. That's perfectly normal. That is why Kanban is so successful when it comes to continuous improvement. It introduces small baby steps, changes, baby, baby steps changes, evolutionary changes, incremental changes that they, they don't, uh, they don't evoke such a resistance. So you try something small, and if it doesn't work, you revert it back. If it works, then you scale it. To answer your question, in order to be able to introduce new changes and start working with data and making data-driven decisions, don't try to change people. Leave them to do what they're already doing, and in parallel, use the new approach. For example, when it comes to forecasting versus estimation, which is something that we're seeing quite often, people are used to estimate work. They're used to, to apply uh, t-shirt sizes or make analysis and, or assign story points. And there are so many approaches to estimate work. They're not used to use performance data and to come up with forecasts and probabilities with a certain date range. Leave them do what they've done so far. In parallel, introduce the new approach. Let them see what the difference is. Let them see how using that new approach is actually changing for good. Let them see that they, they don't need to spend that much time anymore. Let them see the accuracy of both the options. And at some point, it's, it's, called, um, it's called mirroring. Put the mirror in front of them. Put the mirror in front of them. Give them the options, the old option and the new option, and just leave them realize on their own which one is better. And the data will give you the basis to do that. Absolutely. So, yeah, yes. that's an empirical method. So you cannot argue with the data. The old, you can. yeah, no. That's the point. Okay. Any other questions? None so far. Uh, so I have one. Um, what's the good thing about your uh, product is that you can basically collect data from everywhere. So. Yes. Okay. You, have, you have fixed integration and you have an API, so I can basically also, if I have the time, uh, note the values on my whiteboard and feed them into your system and get a graph. So that mm -hmm. yes. would save That's me some if I wanted to and uh, upload an Excel sheet or whatever. So um, my question would be, do you have functions to compare uh, different teams or get an overall performance if you have several services in your company and several boards that handle those services. Um, do you have tools to compare these or get an overall approach for your whole company and your complete service? At this moment, this is something that we're very actively working on. It's called, uh, it's something that we call an executive dashboard that is going to collect all the information from all of your dashboards. So basically it will enable you to make decisions on a high level and strategic level by collecting all of the data from all the different dashboards that you have available at me. 
Um, we expect that to be available in a month or so. Um, so yeah, I'll be happy to keep you posted with the progress. Oh, perfect. Would it also allow something like um, Klaus Leopold's flight level approach or something? To, would, that, would it support that for strategic decisions? Absolutely. Absolutely. The flight levels uh, introduced by Klaus will be indeed uh, um, a foundational part of the executive uh, dashboard. So yes, absolutely. No, perfect. Um, anything. So one additional advantage would then be that the, that the team also has a choice of tools. So if the team is, is happier with Trello than with Jira, they can use Trello. Uh, and if it helps their flow, uh, you can measure it. That's, uh, uh, yeah, in fact, we are such a, we are Kanban practitioners. And at the very beginning, when we started uh, using Kanban, um, our goal was to start with what we do now. We didn't want to reorganize our uh, organizational structure. We didn't want to adopt new tools in order to improve our results. So we wanted uh, to use JIRA and we wanted to keep our development workflow in JIRA. We have, we've made the investment, we have all the team that uh, they, they've already adopted the, the tool. We have all the workflows set up, all the interactions and dependencies were already in place. So pretty much that's how NAIF was born. We started building on the process that we already have in order to improve, in order to speed up our delivery times, in order to be more predictable, to have more, more to have smoother flow of work. So that was the concept behind Nave. Start with what you do now. Start with your own tool. You don't need to, to move everything that you're doing to a specific tool that would um, that would enable you to take the, the most out of the Kanban method. You can still do that with your own tool. In fact, we, in our backlog, we have more than 20 new integrations till the end of this year. So we are actively working in that direction. Oh, perfect. Um, any other questions from the audience? I have one question, if you, if you don't mind. Of course. Hi, Bexod is here. Uh, it's also somehow connected to my first question regarding the continuous improvement and the changing mindset of the people. Um, my question regarding the accessibility of the dashboard to, the, to everyone. You said this NAVE is available basically to everyone, but at the same time, uh, I do know that uh, some teams might be like very uh, sensitive in that regards, for example, uh, the top management seeing their dashboards and uh, uh, there might be a lot of arguments uh, for them making those judgments, for example, because the management doesn't have some context regarding their processes. And as, as a, for example, JIRA da data comes purely from the teams, from the team level. So they basically handling all, all their tickets. As they move the tickets, they are like managing their board. So they, it can be that if they have false uh, the, um, expression that they're being judged on their performance, they can easily trick the system and uh, move the tickets while actually the, the actual work is not being uh, in the same way as in the JIRA. How do you recommend to fa uh, like face those challenges? You should never use metrics to judge people. Never. This is wrong. This is very wrong. Metrics should be used to judge the system, the workflow, the way we manage the flow of work. And I understand that this is very hard to, to be adopted. It's a change in the mindset. The main reason behind NAIF is to enable you to improve to improve your process, to improve your management practices. It should never be used. You should never, use, you should never use metrics to judge people because indeed, if you start doing this, they will start cheating. And if they start cheating, we know how that looks like. So back to your question, um, you have control 
over who is accessing NIF. When I said that everyone can do that, what I meant is that there is no limit on the number of, of, of users that can join your account. Still, there is a user management section in our platform that is going to enable you to uh, invite people, to set certain access uh, rights to each of them. There could be people that only view the dashboard. There are other people who can create dashboards, delete dashboards, edit dashboards, make configurations, and so forth. Um, so basically, it's up to you to decide who you share your data with. There is a flexibility within the tool that is going to enable you to make that decision. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That was also a reminder that Kanban is, is a lot more about a mindset change in the management than it is in the actual work that you do. Um, because um, the first one who has to change their mindset is the manager. Yeah, it's uh, in fact, the, the maturity of any organization is limited by the maturity of the leadership. So it's, it's indeed, that's a key. We need to grow more managers being responsible for managing the flow of work and not the workers. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Going once, <laughs> going twice, <laughs> and gone. Thank you all very much for being here and for the lively discussion. Thank you, Sonia, for the presentation. Thank you for answering nice. all our questions. Um, Sonia is a proficient writer. So if you want to know more, at least judging by her LinkedIn feed, so every day something pops up, mm -hmm. uh, some topic that she has written about. So I will include the links to the NAVE website, of course, and blog and everything uh, in the show notes. Um, and you can learn a lot by just following her on LinkedIn, as I do. So I learn a lot every day, so just by reading your feed. Um, just a reminder that this week has two Mondays. So we will be back on Friday, which is also a Monday because all days are the same um, <laughs> right now. Um, and Katarina Colina from Stiltsoft will talk about how to organize uh, an efficient onboarding process in Confluence. Um, and she will basically show us two options, one with add-ons and one with just pure simple Confluence. And uh, last but not least, we are a proud partner of No Cabin Fever today, and you can find all our talks and one talk every day at 4 p.m. on No Cabin Fever today, and that link will also be in the show notes. With that, again, thank you, Sonia. Thank have you. A, have, a great, have a great time. And everybody, stay healthy and the best of times till we all can meet in person sometime very soon. Have a nice evening. Stay safe. Stay safe.